There was a time in man's history when dominion was interpreted as there for the taking. Somewhere along the way, the right to take was replaced with the responsibility to conserve. Conservation is a widely used term that describes an ideal that can mean different things to different people. But just what does it mean to conserve, and why should we? The answers lie in the word's origin. To the members of the Boone and Crockett Club, conservation has been the guiding principle that has helped the club and its members achieve perhaps the greatest environmental success story in Earth's history. Theodore Roosevelt used the notion of conservation to motivate his friends to form a sporting coalition consisting of scientists, politicians, communicators, and businessmen. The conservancy these men founded was the Boone and Crockett Club, named after two hunter-hero icons of the frontier. One of these founding fathers, George Bird Grinnell, is credited with coining the term conservation and defining it as wise use without waste, shortly before the club was established in 1887. At the time, the word conservation had not been applied or even considered with regard to natural resources. In fact, to that time, the concept of conservation was contrary to the pace and scope of America's maturity as an economic, social, and military power. This was well over a century ago. Since that time, literally everything that has happened that could be labeled conservation has been guided or influenced in one form or another by the club and its members. It is a tradition and obligation that continues to this day. What the club was able to accomplish was no easy feat. Many people and many actions working simultaneously and in concert over decades of time were needed to turn back the natural clock and re-gift America its most valuable assets. A good question now is where did conservation come from and why was it so desperately needed? When our discussion is finished, you will have a more complete appreciation of the innovative system that has made the ever-evolving North American wildlife conservation model the envy of the world, the role the Boone and Crockett Club played in its establishment, and what the club is doing today to ensure its survival. By the late 1880s, much of America's wildlife and wild lands, which gave the New World its health and wealth, had disappeared. Victims of our frontier capitalist exuberance, known at the time as Manifest Destiny, Manifest destiny was the belief that the expansion of civilization across the American continent was inevitable and justified by any means, including the exploitation of our natural resources. By the late 1800s, it was clear, at least to a few people, that the effects of America's rapid growth and prosperity were accomplished at the great expense of these resources. It was the grave conditions we left ourselves in that demanded that the concept of conservation be established and established quickly. the devastating effects of over-harvest by uninformed sportsmen, and even more so from commercial hunting for meat markets, were not the only causes for the greatest drain down of natural resources the world had ever seen. Pristine America's virgin forests were cut, prairies plowed, wetlands filled in or drained, and domestic livestock replaced wild populations, all under the guise of progress. A lack of awareness, laws and sciences, coupled with irresponsible land use and the passing of diseases from domestic stock to wild populations, all took their toll. The nation's sportsmen were the first to cry out and became the architects of the greatest reversal of natural fortune in North American history. America was seen as the land of opportunity, there for the taking. The wilderness was to be viewed as something to be tamed and an abundance of wildlife forests and minerals meant an inexhaustible supply. There were no legal precedents in this matter, 
No real land or wildlife science to teach us any different. Most Americans associated game laws with European tyranny. We simply didn't know any better. We took and we took and we took until there was little left to take. Roosevelt, Grinnell, and the other founding fathers of the club were sportsmen. Their passion for the hunt positioned them at the right place, at the right time. With such a daunting task ahead, the real question was where to start. A plan of action was discussed at the very first meeting of the club in 1887. Job one was to save Yellowstone National Park. One of the club's first initiatives was the protection of Yellowstone Park. Billed as America's playground, the park's pristine state was being plundered by timber and mining interests, as well as poaching. Be it resolved that a committee of five be appointed by the chair to promote useful and proper legislation towards the enlargement and better government of the Yellowstone National Park. A single resolution in a single sentence, but it marked the beginning of the Boone and Crockett Club's conservation crusade. The enlargement and protection of the park was ushered through legislative channels by the club and its members. To seal the deal, the club strategically engaged the public. Through the pages of Grinnell's Forest and Stream magazine and other platforms, the public was made aware of the abuse of their park. With an outraged public, congressional leaders had no choice but to give Yellowstone the protection needed. The crusade to preserve and protect Yellowstone's natural heritage was a seminal point in America's early conservation movement. It was the first time a natural resource issue secured the popular support of the public, both sportsmen and non-sportsmen, from which the conservation concept gained currency, as did the need for concerted national action. Theodore Roosevelt, the nation's 26th president, is credited as our greatest conservation president. What many people don't know is that behind him and his administration were the members of the Boone and Crockett Club. Many hands selected by Roosevelt for their expertise in various areas to help him carry out his vision. This became an operational mode of sorts. Club members would identify problem areas. They would then invite experts on matters of concern to acquaint the membership with the causes and scope of the problem. The club would then form committees to study these problems further and to formulate a strategy. When ready, club members would quietly, behind the scenes, communicate with public officials to frame the problem, its significance, and recommend appropriate actions and legislation to fix the problem. If Roosevelt was the heart and soul of the club, Grinnell was its brain and backbone. Roosevelt got the credit in history, but it was Grinnell who really was the first to comprehend what was wrong and how to fix it. He inspired TR in many of his now famous presidential directives, but there was still more work to be done. Land was needed before it was pillaged further, set aside on behalf of citizens for the continued wealth of the nation. The club helped to craft and then push through Congress the Timberland Reserves Bill of 1891, legislation that was used to save land around Yellowstone and birth the national forest system. With the land secured in the public trust, these lands now needed management. With the help and vision of club member Gifford Pinchot, the U.S. Forest Service was launched in 1905 and subsequently, the National Park Service was established in 1916 to oversee and better manage our national parks. Club member Stephen T. Mather became the first director to lead the National Park Service. Theodore Roosevelt's words still resonate. The American forests are great nurseries for wild game, and they need specific kinds of protection. Roosevelt and other club members in turn established the National Forest Service to administer provident management of these great resources. Now that national forests were secured, proper science and training 
were needed for new forest managers. Where none existed before, Boone and Crocker Club members began funding new knowledge of ecosystem, natural resource, forest, water, and wildlife management. Under the leadership of club members like Aldo Leopold and Gifford Pinchot, colleges began offering the training required. This training created new careers in wildlife biology, fisheries, and forest, water, and soil ecology. Future decisions over public lands and wildlife would now be based on science and administered by trained professionals. Wildlife populations needed a place to sequester and recover from unregulated pounding. The club funded an extensive study of the Black Mesa forest reserves in Arizona to examine the feasibility of a refuge concept on a national scale. The result was the passage of the National Wildlife Refuge Act in 1903. This legislative action set aside sanctuaries as nurseries for recovering wildlife populations. Roosevelt, in turn, claimed Pelican Island in Florida as the first federal bird reserve and the first land unit under the new refuge system. The club knew that the sportsmen alone could not carry the yoke of reform. With the exception of the effort to save Yellowstone Park, the public was still largely oblivious to the plight of the land and its wildlife. Consequently, the club continued to campaign vigorously to engage the people by stirring the pot, making it clear that all wildlife belonged to them and was in their care. What was happening was just as much their loss as it was a loss to sportsmen. This was a dramatic departure from old world ways where the land and its wildlife only belonged to nobility and the entitled. Once the American public was awakened, the outcry was so great that it reached the halls of Congress and further conservation legislation followed with ease. But this was still not enough. Commercial market hunting, a career for many when jobs were hard to find, had to be eliminated if wildlife was to survive. Boone and Crockett Club member Senator John F. Lacey of Iowa saw to this with the passage of the Lacey Act in 1900, making it a federal crime to trade in wildlife, fish, and plants that had been illegally taken, possessed, transported, or sold. This brought a full stop to the commercial value of public wildlife and subsequently market hunting. Sportsmen themselves needed to change their ways, their image, and help fund conservation efforts. Again, the club took action. First, the tarnished image of hunters, incorrectly bestowed on them from the decades of four market slaughter, needed to be reversed. A code of ethical conduct for sportsmen to follow, a degree of fair play and respect for the hunted was needed and discussed at the very first meeting of the club. The name given to this code was Fair Chase. Next was order. Game laws that were in line with conservation objectives needed to be established, along with structured hunting seasons and reasonable bag limits. The club's Fair Chase Code was also used as the cornerstone for these new laws adopted by the states. By defining the roles of respectful engagement and promoting this concept to hunters, the club was able to foster a new breed of ethical sportsmen. By accepting new game laws, bag limits, and the Fair Chase Code, the image of American sportsmen was elevated to that of hunter conservationists. With the momentum of conservation building, financing was needed to ensure its longevity. The club worked decisively for funding legislation, asking those who used the resources to foot the bill for its care and management. Incredibly, in the midst of the Great Depression, sportsmen and the companies that provided their supplies stepped up and reached into their own pocketbooks. With passage of the Federal Duck Stamp in 1934 and the Pittman-Robertson Act in 1937, funding for conservation efforts and law enforcement was secured in perpetuity. In 1906, the club began laying the groundwork for its Records of North American Big Game program, a records keeping and recognition system with three main objectives. The first was to collect 
useful biological and location data from hunter harvest results to be used in wildlife recovery and management efforts. Second was to encourage the selective hunting of mature male specimens, a trophy, that had already genetically contributed to overall herd health. This also facilitated natural replenishment by reducing the pressure on the females and young of a breeding population. And lastly, the insistence that the rules of fair chase be used in the taking of such trophies before both the hunter and his or her trophy will be recognized in the records book. Of all of the club's contributions to conservation, changing a culture that was accustomed to no restrictions and an unlimited take by any method was the most difficult to achieve, yet had lasting results. By hunting selectively for mature animals, done under the highest degree of ethical action, sportsmen were now working with conservation and game management plans instead of against them. The recognition received from trophies listed in the club's Big Game Records program drew even more sportsmen into the conservation movement. The BNC score became spoken language amongst hunters aspiring to put their names and trophies in the records books that are now a celebration of our success in conservation. Still, the club's work was not finished. All that the club and its members created for the greater good was not without pushback and controversy, but it was their commitment to science and education, added to logic and persistence, that ultimately won the day. In 50 short years of existence, club and its members worked relentlessly to establish the legislation, funding, and cultural changes needed to advance the North American wildlife conservation model. With such a list of critical contributions, a good question now is, why is Boone and Crockett mostly known for its big game scoring system and records books? The words of George Bird Grinnell explain this best. It has not been the club's practice to glory in what it has accomplished, but rather to move steadfastly forward, striving constantly to do whatever fell within its province which would tend to promote the country's welfare. Science, education, leadership, hunting and land ethics, legislation, public awareness, big game records keeping and recognition. The complete package was used by the club to create the North American model. And it is these same touchstones the club uses today as evidenced by its many programs. The linchpin, though, is and always will be science-based education. And why? In the final analysis, the intricate ecological world we live in demands a scientific approach. Decisions based only on people's perceptions, emotions, or conjectures won't do. Although time-tested, the North American model is not impervious to threat. As populations increase and open spaces decrease, public education becomes even more critical. This is why the club continues to focus its energies on maintaining a strong educational component to all of its activities. Now and into the future, five key areas have been identified, working from the ground up. Youth education, higher learning, research, leadership training, and conservation policy. Introducing young people to hunting and fishing is certainly a worthy endeavor. But is it enough, practical, and sustaining? Teaching them about the wonders of nature and their place in our natural world has proven to lead to sustained outdoor activities. The burning questions now are how can this be done most effectively? And how do we reach the masses? The club's Conservation Across Boundaries program is a new approach to an old problem. This two-week hands-on field course is designed for classroom science teachers who are committed to integrating natural resource conservation into their curriculum. The multiplier effect is the key. Each graduating teacher is estimated to influence over 11,000 students over their teaching careers. 
Boone and Crockett Club Outdoor Adventure Camps focus on outdoor, hands-on activities, skills, and career exploration with presentations by wildlife and natural resource professionals. Its goals are to create conservation-wise citizens and provide a venue for youth interested in careers in natural resources to interact with wildlife professionals and learn more about the various fields. The club's endowed university programs are focused on graduate students dedicated to the premise that protection, careful management, and shared uses of natural resources can achieve desired social, economic, and environmental conditions without unnecessary waste or depletion. These programs, currently in place at major universities, promote conservation of all resources within a framework where each university's program focuses on one area of research, education, and demonstration. The goal of the university programs is to give graduate students the knowledge they need as they move into professional wildlife and natural resource careers, and to expand this effort into more universities across the country. Such groundbreaking studies as Durward Allen's Wolf and Moose Project on Michigan's Isle Royale that began in 1958, Morris Hornacker's Cougar Study in Idaho in 1967, and the Craighead's Grizzly Project in Yellowstone Park in the 1970s are just a few examples of the club's long-standing conservation grants program. This program provides select graduate students who have chosen a career in the wildlife profession financial support and guidance for their research projects. In most recent years, the club has selected a high-priority research theme and invited proposals from universities in the United States and Canada that have graduate programs in wildlife science or management. When it was determined that by the year 2010, 77 percent of the senior managers of all federal and state wildlife and public lands agencies will be retiring, the club helped to establish the National Conservation Leadership Institute in 2005. Its purpose is to overcome this devastating void in qualified senior level managers with a two-week total immersion leadership training school to jumpstart the next generation. Now, from smallest government agency to the largest conservation federation, there will be a shared confidence that extraordinary leaders equipped with a conservation mission will safeguard our legacy. This program will ensure that our nation has the leadership horsepower to carry the conservation effort into the new century. To sportsmen, and thankfully many others, dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fall of the air and over every living thing that moves on earth from Genesis 128 means to protect and conserve and is not an open license to exploit the environment and its wildlife. It now means a partnership between landowners, government agencies and people who use and appreciate our wild heritage to sustain the land, the wildlife and the ethical uses of both. It means we treat the land with the same respect as we treat the wildlife a land ethic to match fair chase as the gold standard for land stewardship. The North American wildlife conservation model works and improves over time because those who own and use the resources take responsibility for them. History shows that in the beginning, it was the sportsmen taking this responsibility upon themselves. They are the real heroes of conservation. Today, without their passion, observation-based input, stewardship, and funding, this model would simply collapse. For this model to continue to provide for the health and wealth of this nation, sportsmen must continue to take to the fields and streams. On behalf of the Boone and Crockett Club, its members past and present, and everyone who enjoys wild places and wild things, I thank you for your time and continued support for the club's efforts.